Our club's always been a forum for visionaries, public figures, and decision makers to command attention to the issues of our time and inform the most relevant, compelling, and challenging conversations. Here we offer first-person access to dynamic political, business, and public personality. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Glenn Parkinson, President of Canadian Club Toronto, and your host for this afternoon. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those of us joining online at canadianclub.org. And whether you're joining us online or in person here in the room, our event wouldn't be possible were it not for the generous contributions of our sponsors. Today's event is sponsored by Barrick. Thank you for your support. Thanks also to Canadian Bankers Association, our returning season sponsor, and as always, Air Canada, our official airline partner. And we're proud once again to be carbon neutral this season thanks to our partnership with Canada's Forest Trust, fostering sustainable forest practices and connecting Canadians more closely with nature. Thank you, CFT, for planting a forest and preserving it in our honour. Now, Canadian Club Toronto regularly invites young leaders to join us and be a part of our events, and today we welcome a table from the University of Toronto. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you have some great questions for the governor. We like our events to be interactive, and so please, to the table from U of T and to all the tables, please use your question cards and write down any questions you might have as James and the governor are speaking, and we'll run them up to the front. Similarly, for those of us joining online, you'll see a button on the right-hand side of your screen that says uh, click here for questions, to submit a question, and that will make it to our staff here, and similarly, we'll run it to the front. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today and our guest of honor. Governor Joe Lombardo comes from a proud military family. Born in Japan, his childhood was spent abroad until his family settled in Las Vegas. Governor Lombardo earned a degree, a science degree, from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, before serving in the United States Army and the Nevada National Guard. Following his military service, the 31st governor joined, from, joined the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. There, he quickly rose through the ranks and served on nearly every level of the department, from detective to assistant sheriff, he earned his Master's of Science in Crisis Management from UNLV in 2006. Governor Lombardo was elected Sheriff of Nevada's largest county, Clark County, in 2014 and was re-elected in 2018. Last November, he was elected Governor and was sworn in this past January. Joining Governor Lombardo in conversation is James Villeneuve. James is currently strate Senior Strategic Business Advisor with Faskin. He served most recently as Canada's Consul General to Los Angeles, where he was Canada's Senior Representative in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Villeneuve worked for Anheuser-Busch InBev, the world's largest brewing company and the parent to Labatt Brewers, for more than 27 years. And we're also lucky to count him as a former director of Canadian Club Toronto. James and Governor Lombardo, the Canadian Club Toronto podium is yours. Thank you. 
you can. We were a little, uh, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. We were a little confused if I was going to say a few words or not, but uh, there's another individual I, uh, Glenn didn't recognize, but I wanted to make sure I did recognize was, was Colleen in the back of the room there. If we give her a round of applause. She, uh, she's, she's running around a little bit crazy, and uh, I appreciate her efforts. Uh, usually we lose sight of the people that actually get these type of events done, and I absolutely appreciate your hospitality, so thank you. Uh, Glenn, where did you go, Glenn? Over there. Thank you. Thank you for having me today and, and orchestrating this and, and explaining the history of the club and the importance of uh, business success as a result of this club and what you're trying to achieve in this great city in Toronto. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Christine, thank you. Uh, uh, from Barrett Gold. Uh, the, uh, is, do you call it gold now anymore, or is it just Barrick, or Nevada gold mines, or whatever it may be? There we go. So, the gold and copper. Uh, thank you for your sponsorship of this event. And what a great opportunity for an individual like me who recently uh, got elected. And as you can tell by my resume, it's not traditional for somebody in a career in law enforcement to enter in the political world and determine. Um, the direction of your state upon the success of an election. But it always boils down to people and processes, right? And having a vision. And our vision for this trade mission, and the reason why we're here today is how we can move the state forward, diversify the economy, in particular in the mining space and technology, and I'll say it, the battery space. Um, but. I think the bigger issue that we're trying to achieve, and hopefully I'm not getting into your, your, your questions you're going to ask, James, but is, is to have a plan. And, and Toronto is head and shoulders ahead of us in that plan because in the state of Nevada, we, we, we had all our eggs in one basket as far as an economy, and Toronto has done a fantastic job um, looking and having a plan for the future. And that's what we're here to achieve, uh, to build those relationships, develop that plan, bring all the resources together to work as a team and for the success of our, our relationships and in particular, my state in particular. So um, without further ado, I wanna thank uh, each of you again uh, for coming here today and giving me the opportunity to speak and get interviewed and I'm a little nervous. Uh, <laughs> And don't ask about Trump, and we'll be all right. <laughs> and, uh, um, and we'll move forward. All right? Thank you. And prior to, and prior to the first question, uh, I, I guess the core of this, and it was a great opportunity to see this pamphlet on the tables here, and the, our, our saying as a state, and me in particular, my state of the state is Nevada is open for business. Nevada is open for business and, and please, I implore you to meet all my representatives here today and the delegation that is here, chambers of commerce and, and business leaders and let's, uh, let's continue that discussion and ensure that we have success on both sides of the border. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Governor. There we go. Hi. I was a little nervous. Uh, the green light was on the entire time, and I, and I was afraid I was going to say something. So, well, we, uh, <laughs> the, the governor, we're planning. I just want to uh, sound, call out a couple of people too. Richard and Sasha from the Nevada Canada Business Council. Um, we created this when I was consul general down there, and they are uh, a really great membership association. That if any of the Canadian businesses need help, they're good people to call, and they can help you. Richard. Out. Maybe stand up. We say Sasha. You could say Sasha. Sasha, Sasha, Sasha. <laughs> the great people. Um, and thank you, Minister Perry, for coming, representing the Ford government. We'll talk about that in a second. I also want to recognize John Baird, the Honorable John Baird, who is Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister. He actually appointed me when I was Consul General in Los Angeles, Nevada, and Arizona and a great friend of, and is with Barrick uh, on their international advisory board. So 
a great person, a great leader in Canada. So thank you for being here. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit. How do you sit back, you're in the career you had, a very illustrious career, and go, I want to be the governor, or I'm going to take this on? It's the biggest job in the state. What was your thought process on that? Yeah, that's a very, it's, it's an easy question, but it's a very uh, difficult question. And, and obviously, I, I took a great deal of time before I made that decision to the chagrin of my uh, campaign team. Um, they were saying, hey, make a decision, Jesus Christ. And I said, well, it's a, it's a big deal, right? <laughs> and it's a, you know, I, I already profess a, a career in law enforcement, and, and you get comfortable being comfortable. Right? You're a subject matter ex expert in a particular industry, and, and you're going to go into the great unknown. And so well, one of my mentors said, hey, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And we had a lot of things going on in the state of Nevada, in particular to the previous administration. And, and I thought some decisions were poorly made, um, ill-conceived, not well thought out. And I just, you know, and it's not a level of arrogance. I think, I think there is a, a certain level of arrogance in politics, per se. Um, but to be a little more humble, I, I knew I could do a better job. You know, we, there, there was different responses as a result of crisis uh, via COVID. Um, you know, my platform in, in the politics and the, the campaign was based on the economy, first and foremost. But education, second, and, and, and quality of life, public safety. And, and I felt comfortable in the public safety piece, but education was near and dear to me. And we were constantly being measured across the, the other states in the United States, and we were at the bottom of the barrel. And the previous administration, I, I, I personally believe, was failing to address the, the, the problems that were occurring in the state of Nevada. And hey, I could do a better job. I could do a better job. And quite often, a lot of people default to if people are asking you I am so and so is asking me. So and so is asking me to run, and that didn't occur in my case. I was a, I was a one-off uh, per se, and and I personally made the decision on my own, obviously with the influence of my family. But I, I just put it to a, to a cellular level. I could do a better job. Correct. So good. Well, congratulations. That's Thank a great you. Decision to run, and I'll ask you another question. I watched the. Uh, people may have seen the Schwarzenegger documentary on Netflix, and the last one is when he's elected governor. And he said, nothing prepared me for the day I walked into the office and everything was on my desk, compared to all the other experiences he's had. Right, and the same thing, same thing for me. It was a new challenge. And you know what motivates you other than a new challenge? But, but it still boils down to it, and I alluded to it when I was standing at the dais there, was it becomes people and processes. And, and if you have, keep that in mind, and your core values, what they elected you for, um, it's, it makes it that much easier to provide direction. Right. And the state itself, maybe talk a bit about, I got to know the state when I was down there quite a bit, of call it the diversity or the things you want to say, the challenges you have. What, with all of the growth you have going as well, what are the biggest challenges? Well, um, you know, the reason why we're here, I, I, th I personally believe, you know, a lot of people think it's water or, or, or other, energies, but the diversification of the economy, um, you know, the proliferation of gaming, per se, across the United States and, and to include the world. Uh, many government leaders are using gaming to, to balance their, their budgets um, to where we've been there, done that. And we are the best of the best, the gold standard, but we have to diversify in, in, to ensure success. And that's why we're here today. And that's why I'm making the effort. And the uh, Counselor General uh, earlier this morning said there hasn't been a governor in the city of Toronto and what, for what he knew in the last five years. Wow. And I think it's important for me to be front facing on that. I know there's some other delegations uh, bouncing around the, uh, your country. Uh, you know, they're creeping around the country. <laughs> um, we're more, we're more uh, uh, forward facing by the fact that me as the governor is I'm here. I'm right. here uh, speaking on behalf of the state and ensure that we create momentum, ensure that we're engaged and having a conversation. So to furtherance of your question, James, you know, that, and then you get into the education space, which I talked about. It's important that we, uh, we improve upon the education to develop the labor force to occupy those jobs we're intending to bring into the state. So that, 
that's what's keeping me up at night. The things that I'm comfortable with is fighting crime and quality of life. You know, I don't want, it sounds a little passe, but I could do that in my sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to do is rely on the experts in the room, uh, build the team off of that, like individuals like here, Tom Burns, who's on TikTok while I'm talking. <laughs> um, um, and, 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 and get, be the, have them be the force multiplier for me to achieve. But I, I think the reason for my presence is, you know, he can do what we're trying to accomplish without me here, but the reason my presence is here is to ensure that it, it shows the level of importance. Right. And this trip has been, we're kind of halfway through it now. You went to Montreal. Correct. Um, for a couple of days. What were some of the highlights there of things you saw there? Nothing. <laughs> That's what Torontonians want to hear. <laughs> I'm joking in, in some aspects, but you know, yeah, it's a one, it's a wonderful city. You know, it's a wonderful <laughs> province. But I, I've actually had the opportunity to be in Montreal previously. I've, this is the first time I've been in here in Toronto. But uh, unfortunately, my staff is too efficient, and they they have occupied every minute of my day. And I, ha I didn't get to experience the culture of the, of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody tells me it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, but what, what's, I think the difference is, and I would say, you know, obviously this is the financial capital of Canada and, and you know, the, the hub of the wheel per se and what we're trying to achieve here today. But it's, uh, they brought some different ideas uh, forward. And I think that's the important piece. And the reason why you don't stay in one city and, and you, you explore is there's different businesses, obviously, that are based or headquartered into those there, but the, the ideas are different and the diversification of ideas. And the other thing that's uh, um, really it, it strikes home for me is I had the opportunity to meet your premier mm -hmm. today. I, I didn't when I was in Quebec. And the excuse was he was out of town. So I don't know if it was an excuse or not, but the, uh, um, but that, that, that's, that's cool, right? That's yeah. cool. And, uh, and, and fortunately your premier had, uh, he's on the same wave, wavelength as I am. And we had the opportunity to sign an MOU right. to agree on relationships and trade ideas and, and continue to build those relationships to ensure the benefit of both yeah. um, jurisdictions. And the, and the mining component is a big part of this. Obviously we have a lot of miners in the room. Right, and Barrick is our the mining is, minister. is our sponsor, and, and and your minister is here, and and that's Nevada. That's the uniqueness of Nevada. So you talk about gaming and entertainment. Okay, what else do you got? What can you do for me now? And and that's it. It's mining and, and natural resources, and the abundance of it, and the ability to uh, figure out how to process it, mm. and, you know, and and reclaim it, and and all the other. Um, you know, the, the concerns that go along with the industry. And you mentioned last night and again today some of the challenges with the amount of federal land that is in the state yeah. and getting permits for mining. I want to talk a bit about so that. So interesting enough is just for the states, um, not, not the states, the rooms education, um, 80 plus percent of the state of Nevada is encumbered by the federal government. And you know that's a that's a long um, history associated with that with the military and everything else. and and it was the home of the ammunition depot, per se, for the war machine uh, during the war uh, front. And so it, it was controlled by the federal government. And then the Bureau of uh, Land Management got involved into that process because, for, in my opinion, affordable housing and expansion of the economy is based on availability of land mm. and affordable land and the ability for the contractors to, you know, um, to a, a, a achieve a certain price point in order to make it affordable. And, you know, and talking to your premier here, that's your biggest issue yeah. here in this space and affordable housing and how they're gonna do that in conflict with the, whatever special groups are fighting against it. Um, but in the state of Nevada, unfortunately, it's encumbered by the federal government. So it's a long, laborious process to negotiate with them for the release of the land and the price point uh, to achieve what we're trying to achieve. And, and fortunately, um, I thought it was a huge hindrance in, in the United States to, in, in obtaining federal uh, licensure, you know, when you're putting uh, shovels in the ground and, and permitting, but the, your premier and, and the minister there in Montreal told us it, it's double the time to get the shovel in the ground here in, in Canada. And 
So now I feel better about myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing uh, we should talk about, because this is the fun stuff, I think, is how Las Vegas has turned into the sporting capital, maybe, of the world. Um, with the, we were, last night we went and met with the Blue Jays. Um, we went to the game and went, met with the Blue Jays, and uh, the Oakland Athletics are looking to move. I know you talked to Mark Shapiro last night. Any thoughts on that? Or? Well, first and foremost, Mark is an incredible guy. Hmm. Um, very uh, gracious and uh, has some huge vision uh, for Major League Baseball and, and your team. And let's just clear the air, folks. I didn't, I'm not the reason why they lost last night. So, so um, he told me his wife is a Yankee fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we're we're looking to we we have expanded into the athletics uh, sporting space, and I have to apologize again. We have the Golden Knights. <laughs> when was the last time Canada won the cup? Uh. Toronto, at least. Did you say 67? Toronto, yeah. So am I safe if I wear that Maple Leaf jersey that the Premier gave me? Yeah. Okay. People like it here. Man, that really got a groan. I thought that was <laughs> funny. The, uh, um, so, we, yeah, the Golden Knights, uh, uh, Mr. Foley, the owner of the Knights, had predicted they would win the cup within six years. And you know, on the sixth year, they were able to do that. And then we have the the former Los Angeles Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, are, are housed in, in Las Vegas, and, and now we're attempting to get the Oakland A's there. So the Oakland A's process is pretty much baked in. Um, the only thing that's outlined or you know, that we still have to achieve is the vote of the Major League Baseball owners. Mm -hmm. And Mark told me last night that he's on board, yeah, he and, so don't give him a hard time. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I anticipate they're going to be successful in that vote, and hopefully they, they'll be breaking ground as soon as possible. Right, and there's some public money that you supported going into that. Right, so we, uh, that, that's a key thing. You know, in the state of Nevada, through the Office of Economic Development, we, ha we offer abatements and incentives in different forms and fashions to, in order to entice uh, business to come in. I'm very proud of the ability to bring Tesla into the state of Nevada, not myself but I am proud of the doubling of their footprint under my uh, administration and then to include companies like Redwood Materials and, and now we're looking at the Oakland A's and, and there's some young men right there to, in the back of the room that are attempting to bring uh, the NBA into Las Vegas. So thank you for being here and thank you for, they got their heads down. So, <laughs> <laughs> so but the, people are starting to realize the location more than anything is beneficial in the sports world, to, and you know, I'm also proud that we had the, the most we have the most Canadian hockey uh, players on the Golden Knights, yeah. right? And so, by by happenstance, or it, it might not be, it was just by the proximity of the border, our, our number one tourism piece in the sporting piece is Canadians, yeah. and so it's a benefit to us. And baseball fills that void that we currently have during the summer months in our. Yeah in our neighborhood and on the tourism stuff and air canada's here WestJet's here they and this kind of blew me away when i was consul general meeting with people that approximately 70 percent of the foreign visitors into nevada las vegas are canadian so that there's direct flights from everywhere in this country so it's obviously a a place canadians love to go to and and want to interact with and add in the business component it's a, a natural fit so yeah so as far as WestJet and and, and I don't want to use you in the same sentence because I know you guys are competitors, <laughs> right? And Air Canada, but I think uh, he said it. He said it. I didn't say it. He says, uh, um, you need to increase your flights. <laughs> right? And some of the other people you met with, you met with the F1 people in Montreal, Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. Nice comeback for them after bankruptcy. And what did they share information with you? or? Uh, F1 or CERT? Both. Okay. Yeah, F1 was, it was good because anytime you have something of that magnitude enter your, your space and you've never done it before, you want to rely on the people that have been there and done it, right? And all the representatives and all the countries that currently have F1 have been very gracious to us. We've made a significant effort to travel and talk and, and 
you know, the different nuances of the race and whether it's inside the, your urban area or outside your urban area, how business continued during the race and the length of the, of the encumbrance. All those questions have to be asked and, you know, the simple things is how many latrines do you need, you know, things like that. It's, it, it makes a difference in the experience of the customer, right? And so that ensures longevity if it's a good experience. And, and the folks here from F1 uh, there in Montreal, they were very gracious to have a good conversation with us and to include Cirque. Cirque is based there in Montreal and we have six different Cirque shows in Las Vegas and, and they made it through the COVID piece and were able to recruit new performers and, and continue in that. And I, I personally believe that was a watershed event in Las Vegas and entertainment when Cirque first uh, put roots mm. into the Las Vegas and it changed the whole dynamic of entertainment um, in Las Vegas and it's, it, it was a, a momentum multiplier with their presence and they, they informed us they're, they're back to pre-COVID performances and the numbers around the world. Um, but they, they also have a couple that are online to, to debut here shortly, wow. and that was proprietary. They wouldn't tell me what that was. But, the, uh, but I'm, I'm so happy that they're, they've recovered and they're, and they're successful. It's a, it's a wonderful company, and, and it's a little out of my uh, realm of understanding in a business mm -hmm. model, but mm -hmm. I'm glad they're able to pull it off. That's good. That's good. Um, we've got some audience questions here. I'll just take a couple Are you going to vet them first? Or no? I'm vetting them, vetting them. This one, and I learned a lot about this last night, actually, more than I care to know about, but it was really interesting, was just, tell us about lithium in Nevada. So, yeah. What it's needed for. Well, obviously, lithium is, fortunately, we've discovered one of the biggest deposits in the world, right? And, and, and lithium is the, the uh, future and what we're trying to achieve in the EV space and, and, and anything associated with the powering of a battery. And, and everybody around the world is in reliance in what we're trying to achieve in a negative carbon uh, footprint and, and longevity um, as compared to fossil fuels and, you know, in, in, in every aspect, as you, as you can imagine, your, your cellular phone. So the key ingredient in my understanding, my minor understanding of chemistry is lithium is, is the one that's going to create the longevity of the battery and the sustainability of the battery. So uh, fortunately, Nevada contains significant deposits and we intend to um, be very successful on the processing of that. And one of the representatives of Lithium Americas is sitting up here, um, Tim. Tim, thank you for being here. And, uh, and, but it's to a benefit of all of us. So not, you know, it's just not the people that put the shovels in the ground and own the mines, it's all the people that have to process it and package it and, and deliver it, right? The freight, the freight that is required to deliver it and then actually deploy it. And uh, the counselor this morning, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was, uh, correct me, Tom, it was from the mine to mobility, right? And so our saying was from the cradle to the, gr to the grave to uh, resurrection. resurrection. So, and the resurrection piece is how do you clean up the, the talons associated with mining, if it's precious metals or not, uh, nickel, copper, whatever it may be, and then, and then uh, um, reclaim the environment, right? And uh, so, that's where Nevada is, and, and we need the help of wonderful people in this room and in cities and provinces and countries such as Canada to help us with that. And we can help you um, in that endeavor because you're packaging the batteries here in Canada and we're the source, the lithium. So I think we want to make it from the cradle to the grave um, within our own environments, but it requires a lot of help in relationships. Yeah, and we have our friends from the TSX here who uh, I'm told that the um, is the largest mining exchange in the world. So there's a lot of capital here. Is there available. more than one mining exchange? I don't know. Well, well it's the largest in the world. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a governor. Um, and our friends at Faskin are one of the top law firms in the mining world that I do work with too, so that I have a lot of good clients. Um, you know, the, the other piece on that, James, and I'm, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but the other piece is the bureaucracy, right? You know, here we got the State Department here helping us with the, those conversations, but 
there's a lot of people that have history in the bureaucracy of, of getting that shovel in the ground, right? And, and the EPA, the environmental folks, and, and the federal government, and, and their blocking of the whatever we're trying to achieve as an economy and as a state and as a province. And they're as important as the, as the people that are, yeah. are, have the boots on the ground. And, and you know, death by, by cuts um, via the government bureaucracy uh, has to be eliminated. So. Yeah, and that, that could be learning exchange there too with our right. governments for sure in terms of getting things done. Um, here's a question. What is the secret treasure in Nevada Canadians should know about? <laughs> the secret treasure, well, you know, it depends if it's indoors or outdoors. Um, you know, there's significant shows that change by the week in Las Vegas. We mentioned Cirque, but outdoors, the Red Rock uh, um, Conservation Area, which is the, the number two uh, rock climbing uh, area in the world currently, not, not, not in just the United States, but in the world. Hmm. And then that is probably the outdoor recreation piece. And the key with Las Vegas, one is transportation. It's a hub, easy transportation, in and out, ingress, egress, but it's also recreation. It's easy to get to anywhere, anything you want to do uh, <clears throat> from a short distance. So and plus the, the proximity to one of the largest economies in the world, California. I, yeah, I said California, I didn't want to, but I had to <laughs> because... <laughs> But that helps in your decision to come to Nevada. The, the, the ports that are, are associated with California and, and the transportation hubs that are there. I mean, un, unfortunately, unfortunately, I mean, we talked about Silicon Valley earlier, how it's emptying out, but there, all those companies are coming in. I talked to the premier about that today, but all those companies are coming into the space. But the hidden gem, personally for me, is the restaurant world. Um, I think we have some of the best restaurants in, in the world um, there present in, in Las Vegas. So if, you, if you're not a gambler, you, don't, you know, that's not your thing, we got everything else, right? right? And, and we, we're, I promise we'll entertain you, and, but as a state, we need to diversify. And we have friends here from FanDuel. Dale, President of Canada, FanDuel. Are you having, there's a referendum of some sort on sports gaming coming up, right? Or is there some changes happening on that? No, not that I know. Nothing you know? Okay. Well, there's, there's always a, a question on online gaming. Right. Uh, whether that's going to occur in Nevada. And, and as long as I'm a governor, um, the governor, um, it won't happen. Okay. Okay, because I have a, a close relationship with the people that live in Nevada. And, and the brick and mortar that goes along with that. And, you know, there's, there's discussion, but there's gotta be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, firewalls put up before we make that decision. Okay. That, that, that may be um, the, what the question is, um, but sports gaming is proliferated across the United States. Right. Um, this is a very specific question, but I'll ask it anyway, because somebody obviously is interested in this. Um, Pending hotel workers strike in Vegas, would the state consider raising the minimum wage or what's your thoughts on that? Well, the, the, the minimum wage is codified already into law. And I believe, and is Paul here or Mary Beth? Um, how far out does the, is the minimum wage codified? Every, it increases every other year for a, a period of time. I don't know the year of termination. Uh, so that's already built in, but the, the culinary strike, that is the, uh, your workers uh, in the casino space or the food space, uh, service workers. Uh, unfortunately, every corporation has a different contract and all those contractors, all those contracts came to expire in the same year and the same month across the entire gaming space. So that's what we're dealing with. And so I don't know if they're encompassing them all together to make the decision to strike um, and they're not separating the properties or the corporations separately. But that's a big decision to be made and, and obviously you wanna take care of your workers, right? And that, that's the service piece that makes people return and have a, have a wonderful experience. Uh, but I personally don't know the nuances okay. of the thing. One of the things that we've experienced across the board is the, the exchange of technology versus human, late, human capital. Is technology going to put the worker out of business? And that is some of their concern um, in that space. Okay. Um, the MOU that you signed with the province today, somebody asked, um, 
vis-a-vis -vis bilateral trade and investments. Did you get in any discussion on how that's going to work, or is it just that you've agreed to talk more and figure out ways to work together? That, that's it exactly. We agreed to, to talk more and to have open communications. And it's nothing bound by law. It's not binding. Uh, but it, it is an agreement that we're going to get along and, and for the success of both of us. Right. Right. And those relationships, share technology ideas, uh, share, share vision, and, and ensure that we are, we're both successful as a result. One of the things I know you're doing tomorrow uh, before you leave is seeing the pre-clearance operation up at Pearson Airport. Um, I, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure got on the agenda because it's a real... Um, not a right for Canadians, but a privilege that we pre clear our airports before going to the United States. So obviously getting people into Vegas quickly, less hassle, that's a good thing. So, and Yeah, and you know, that works both ways, right? And ensure that we get into Canada quickly. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that's some of the fear. You want to ensure that your people have you know, access to ensure that your, that access or that lack of access doesn't change their mind. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and with the governors in the southern states, I remember with your predecessors talking about this just based on discussions get going on southern border, northern border, same amount of resources that our goal was always that the resources don't get taken from Canada. Obviously, that's a big issue. But. Right, and a lot of that access piece, too, is, is based on the, the, I guess the best word I would use is the, the ability of the law enforcement to understand people's background or to access people's backgrounds. A lot of times when you have people coming in from other countries, you know, you, you have no idea who they are, but because of the relationship Canada and the United States has in the law enforcement space, it makes it that much easier. Hmm. This is an interesting question. Um, just as sheriff, then governor, how will, you, how will you be able to maintain security at Nevada, most notably Las Vegas? What is the most important part of this cross-sectional work with other law enforcement agencies? Um, just your thoughts on that. You were obviously the, um, the sheriff when the incident happened in Las Vegas. Yeah, the one October at the Mandalay Bay. Um, so I'm just trying to understand the question a little bit better. Is, is there a fear that there's a void of security because I'm gone? <laughs> no. I think it's just more there's a lot of big events. Right, a yeah, there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of communication occurs. And, and you know, it's malpractice if you don't learn from your mistakes. And, and you know, we made some mistakes in response to one October, but... And, you know, there, there, you can what if a scenario till the cows come home. Um, and in this case, we, we didn't what if that scenario it was hard to predict. But the important piece is on how you respond to it and how you put, you know, harden your target prior to. So um, all these things, the Super Bowl, the F1, uh, New Year's Eve celebrations, you know, all the different events that you experience in, in a huge metropolis area like uh, Toronto, um, we're in constant contact. So like the mining associations are always talking to each other. Um, and the medical association talks to each other. The, the law enforcement talks to each other. There's, there's different associations where you exchange those ideas and ensure that, you know, everybody's doing best practice. And, right. and I'm ensuring that fortunately, because it, one of my pillars of my campaign was quality of life slash public safety was that all the representatives of the law enforcement throughout the state continue to communicate right. and continue to uh, ensure that they're they're partnering because just like every other industry just like air canada or westjet or whatever it may be the lack of resources and you know maybe pilots right and so you need you may have to rely on other folks to to bolster your effort uh it's the same thing in law enforcement uh, you know, you can't, one particular police department in Toronto can't cover well, however many, seven, 7 million, 17 million in the metropolitan area um, by themselves. So that's how you do it. Right. The head of the agency, you know, you can't have fiefdoms or silos, uh, you know, stay out of my backyard kind of thing. Um, no, you guys got to work together. Right. Um, I'll ask it because somebody asked it. Any federal Election predictions? <laughs> I told you not to ask that. <laughs> I said, whatever you do, don't bring that up. No, I have no predictions. Uh, I've said publicly, I'm a Republican, um, conservative um, in you know, United States politics, uh, but I've, I've made a decision to um, not get involved until after the primary. Right. So, and, 
and because there's a lot of players in the game, right? And, and there's a lot of things that happen in people's personal lives and, and in politics and crisis yeah. uh, during the interim. So Great. Well, thank you. Thank we you. actually have a little reception later um, at the Hockey Hall of Fame with the Golden Knights, which will be fun. Get to see the Stanley Cup in Toronto. Not with the Leafs, but <laughs> close as you might get to it. Um, well, Is it I really, the real Stanley Cup? Yeah, yeah. Well, they have two of them. There's one that travels around, and there's one here. So you'll see them, the one that's here, um, which will have Vegas Golden Knights on it and players' names. It's a good thing. Um, I just want to thank the governor. I think it, then I'll just conclude by saying this, that whenever we get a governor, uh, and Mr. Baird would know this more than anybody, just to get your attention and to have you up here is a good thing for us as a country to see what we're all about, learn about us. We're learning about you. Um, and, you know, it's obviously a place that Canadians love to go to and will continue to go to. So thank you for taking the time and for interacting with us today. Um, I'll turn it back to the president. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Governor Lombardo, on behalf of Canadian Club Toronto, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your passion and we applaud your vision for Nevada and really respect your leadership. So thank you. And, and hopefully next time you'll make some time to be able to see the city a little bit more. And uh, yeah, so this is right there. Uh, we know who to talk to. And with the pending increase in flight schedule from WestJet and Air Canada, we'll be able to see you more often too. Before we close, I'd like to invite you to look at our upcoming events, starting with one tomorrow. We've got uh, September 28th, as the, as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation approaches on the 30th, we'll be hosting a panel of Indigenous business leaders and allies to discuss what more can be done to unlock Indigenous participation in the Canadian economy. And as we head into October, we'll be hosting a panel on the efforts to decarbonize the aviation industry with panelists from Airbus, Air Canada, Greater Toronto Airport Authority, that will be on October the 5th. And there's many more upcoming events you can find on CanadianClub.org. Let me conclude by thanking um, our AV partner, VVC Live, as always, for effectively facilitating today's event. Thank you, members and guests, for joining us and joining us online, and we'll see you next time. Have a good afternoon.